Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to track 61 of the 4x4 Earth podcast. A four-wheel drive death in Arizona. Lessons we can all learn. Join James from 4x4earth.com as he learns all there is to know about four-wheel driving, camping, fishing, and getting out and exploring our great country on the 4x4 Earth podcast. Today's podcast covers a very somber topic. Last week... A family of five went four-wheel driving on what should have been, you know, a good day out, have a bit of fun, get a bit of mud on the vehicle kind of day. Tragically, it ended in horrific circumstances with Ryan Woods, the driver, being killed by a tow hitch, smashing through the windscreen, hitting the steering wheel and bouncing up into his face and killing him in front of his wife and three children. This tragic accident has seen worldwide social media and partially the fact that so many people aren't aware of the danger and the impact that attempting a recovery off recovery points that aren't rated to do that recovery can have. We put a post up on Friday about it. It's had over 30,000 views, which I think is really tragic, but it's really good in the fact that The people involved in the accident have been really quite keen in people sharing the photos that have been taken, and they are quite confronting, but I'll include a link in the show notes. They've been really forward on people sharing this because they don't want what has happened to them to happen to anyone else. What I wanted to do is to get a four-wheel drive expert on the podcast to be able to talk about it, to go through exactly what happened, and then look at some of the alternatives, some of the ways that this tragic accident could have been avoided so that the next time people head out uh, on a great day of four wheel the next time people head out uh, on a great day of four wheel driving uh, everyone comes back to do that i've got matt from mad matt four wheel drive he's got a lot of four wheel drive experience a lot of recovery experience and critically uh, he's done a really good video that explains some of the issues that came up in this recovery accident definitely check out the show notes there'll be links to his website, his YouTube channel. He's got some really interesting videos there. And also I've got some links to Robert Pepper. He's done a really good video that's quite technical, but explains the issues that occur in these kinds of recovery, the forces that are generated and why snatch recoveries are so dangerous. And lastly, we've got some photos from that day. And I think you know, there's a couple of things that that are really important when you have a look at those videos. One, it's a bog hole that I think any of us would have had a crack at. It doesn't look intimidating at all. But when you have a look at the vehicle that's stuck in there, it's well and truly stuck. And quite confronting photos as well uh, as you, you see the damage that's done and, and the impact that it's had on all of the people who were involved that day. Here's Matt and let's go through what happened and see what we can learn from it. Hey, Matt, welcome to the podcast. Yeah, man, it's good to be here. I think this is my first time, although we've met before, I think this is my first time part of the podcast, so I'm excited. I'm excited too, Uh, although in relatively tragic circumstances. So do you want to talk us through what happened in Arizona last week? Yeah, look, I woke up on Friday morning last week to find out that, I guess on Thursday, Wednesday or Thursday, American time, they're a day behind us. There had um, been a, a serious tragedy and a guy called Ryan had been killed doing a recovery and a, just a kinetic recovery, a snatch recovery, as many of your audience would know it, which, you know, let's face it, as full drivers, we're all out there. Genetic recovery, a snatch recovery, as many of your audience would know it, which, you know, let's face it, as full drivers, we're all out there doing recoveries regularly when we go full driving and the kinetic recovery is is probably the most favorite recovery method that people are using and I, I think that's actually a shame i don't think that's the way it should be but we can go into that later in the podcast but that's what happened and yeah ryan's no longer with us he leaves behind us a wife and three kids and you know friends and all that all because uh you know either well we don't know the motivations and that but at the end of the day, incorrect equipment was used incorrectly, and he's dead. So, very, very sad situation. Very tragic, because I think the family were in the car when it happened as well. Yeah, it's exactly right. So, he'd been he'd been married to his wife, Jennifer, for 23 years. The three kids, um, I believe all three, so Darren, Madison, and London, 
were all impacted. And we mustn't forget Ryan's mate who came out that night just to help a mate out. How many of us have done that? You know, there's a mate gives you a bell. Oh, man, I'm stuck up the back. You know, can you come and give me a snatch? And it's like, yeah, man, I'll come up, you know. And, they, you know, he doesn't want to. He wants to stay home and whatever. But he gets in his truck because a mate needs him and he goes out not intending to do anything bad, like just helping a mate out. And next thing he finds, he's killed a good mate. I mean, I, I don't know who that guy is, but he must be in a world of hurt right now. And there's multiple victims in a situation like this. And, yeah, they're all to be supported. And I hope that their community is supporting all of them. Absolutely, yeah. I think very traumatic for the family. And, and as you point out, you know, because we've all been in that, situation you know and probably most of us on both sides of it you know the ones being stuck mm. and, and the one who are out there trying to help so what situation did ryan find himself in yeah well apparently so i mean obviously i've spoken to justin who was part of the vehicle recovery post the tragedy right so he wasn't part of the failed recovery very i want to make that very clear so i've spoken with justin about this and basically Ryan and his family have gone out for a bit of a run in their local four-wheel driving area, which apparently is more or less man-made area where there's been a lot of earthworks and such going on for many, many years. And the moment it rains out there, everybody sort of heads out and goes driving through mud holes and bogs and whatever and just generally having a bit of fun out there with their four-wheel drive. So he was out there doing exactly that as he had many times before with his family. Yeah, yeah, and he just uh, got stuck and... He was driving a, a Ford Super Duty, so a fairly decent sized four wheel drive, and had, I believe he had at least a rear locker, if not front and rear lockers. And yeah, down, and yeah, down he went into this soup. And I think here yeah. in Australia, certainly where we're speaking from, is we're all familiar with that crust that breaks through into a soup underneath. And I'm assuming it was something of that nature. So he's ended up bogged, and that's when he's given his motor call to come and give him a quick recovery. You know, as we know, and for those that don't know, when a vehicle gets bogged in mud, it, it generates a huge amount of suction. And so there's a number of techniques that are really important to apply in, in, in that recovery. And now, from my observation of looking at the images, the static pictures, some of those procedures, well, none of those procedures have really been brought to bear in this situation. And I think that that's a significant issue. So... Do you want to start talking about some of that stuff now or just continue with how it sort of happened? What are some of those issues? Why is it so difficult to get a vehicle? The Ford Super Duty, it's a big truck, isn't it? Sure is. So, I mean, I've got a 2002 Ford F-250 myself and then I've got my Land Cruiser and the F-250 dwarfs the Land Cruiser in physical size and weight as well. So they are a very big vehicle and yet they run on a similar size tyre. So the amount of pressure on the tyre is, is quite significant. Now, basically, you know, when a vehicle gets stuck in mud, there's a suction element of it. And the, that just means that the, when you start to move the vehicle, you've got to give time for the air to get in underneath the vehicle and, and free it from this, this mud because the mud and moisture seal up any air from getting under the vehicle. And so it literally sucks to the mud. There's a term that the guys that get about forward ride training developed John Eggenhausen and Carl Eggenhausen they developed a procedure called the hierarchy of recovery now we all probably know it but they put it into a framework to give it help us really understand it and really it's the simple things first you know start with your well I like to put it this way start that you're actually in four wheel drive make sure you've aired your tyres down are you in high range low range uh, depending on the situation you, you need to be like start there you know that's part of a recovery making sure those things are crossed off next thing you're going to do is get your shovel out. You're going to use dig out around the vehicle and reduce your recovery load. And even that in itself can get you out of a bogging situation. But then, you know, use use traction boards, whether it be a tread board type device or a um, logs or something, jack the vehicle up and get something under the wheels. And I know this is all hard work and physical, and it sounds so much easier just to hook up the snatch strap and get the job done in two minutes flat. But... There's a safety element which is highlighted in this situation. So you do that and then after that you try what we call a toe recovery. And I'll come back to that in a minute because um, there's some interesting things to explore with this recovery on that. 
then after that, we, we start looking at winch recovery, and that's single line winch, double line, triple line winch, pull multiple vehicle winches. It could be a number of things there. And then you'll finally come to the last, and that's your kinetic recoveries, which we used in this situation. And there's there's an awful lot of energy used in a kinetic recovery and generated, and I want to talk about that a little bit in a moment as well. But, yeah, so for me, I think I last did a proper kinetic recovery about two years ago. They're very rare. They should be a very rare form of recovery, in my opinion. And the, the main reason for that is the uncontrolled energy generation. So if you think about but in the time, if you want me to stop talking, because I'll keep talking, James. <laughs> no, all good. I think this is really important that people understand these the issues with each of these. Well, A, what the options are. Because, I mean, when I was a... Uh, a newbie four wheel driver, you know, I got stuck a couple of times, a couple of times, and you're just like, "Holy crap! How do I get out of this? Like, what are my yeah. options?" Because when you're off road, it's very, very different. You know, the surface is different. You got to do things like how many people haven't let their tires down enough? That can make a huge difference. And you see people snatching all the time because it's kind of, you know, it looks sexy on YouTube, I think, and you see a lot of people yeah. doing it. And very, very few. The thing that scares me the most is when you come across someone who's stuck and you'll see them snatching and it almost looks like a, a great event and everyone's watching. There's kids, there's everyone, everyone watching and you think, holy cow, if this goes pear-shaped, multiple mm. people could die. And you just say, hang on a sec, people. And many people just don't realize the danger that they're in. So no, keep going. Yeah, you're exactly right. So let's come back. I'm trying to keep this in some form of logical conversation so that it kind of makes sense to the listeners. And I know, so that it kind of makes sense to the listeners. And I know many of the listeners are, are nodding frantically in their vehicles because I think over time we're all getting more educated. And I include myself in that. I'm regularly chatting with people about this sort of stuff so that I can learn and my procedures have changed. Over, the, over time as I've learnt about, you know, what goes wrong, how can we improve it and seeing somebody do something and, it, and I go, I actually think that makes a lot safer, more sensible solution. So old mate's turned up to do this recovery and now he's, he's sort of been pulled out of his jacuzzi and, and we, we stop out into the Ulu and he hasn't really but had taken the time to go and grab all his recovery gear and his equipment Apparently this guy's a very experienced four-wheel driver, been wheeling for many years, and, and so this is all very familiar. And I think that's the first danger is the moment we all feel like it's familiar. It's the same old, same old. And the moment we get to that place, we start to expose licency, and possibly that's come to bear here. So the first thing he's done is he's hooked up to this vehicle. Now, he's used a couple of chains off the front of the vehicle, off the two front recovery points. Obviously, you know, it'd be nice to use a proper bridle, and soft shackles and all that, but it is my belief that a correctly rate and like high tensile, correctly sized chain would be acceptable. The issue with a lot of chains is that they're worn and secondhand because you, you know somebody got them off his mate who's a rigger, and the chain's been condemned, but it's, he's gone, oh that'll work. Well, that may not be the case. So you've got to, you know, assuming that equipment's in good order, I think a chain can be used as a bridle where required, but. He's used his chain, he's hooked up, he's hooked up a strap. Now, this is the next problem, I believe. The strap, to our knowledge, was not not a, a kinetic rope or a kinetic strap, like a snatch strap. It was a toe strap type thing or a, a lifting, but it didn't, apparently it didn't have the stretch. Now, the other option in there, and again, I, I don't have this detail to know for sure, but the snatch straps do wear out. They do lose their stretch. And they need to be either thrown away at that point in time or they need to be knowingly used only as a tow strap or a tow rope and not as a kinetic recovery rope. So old mate's come in, he's hooked all of this gear up. Now he hasn't had, he's had on the back of his vehicle what we call a drop hitch. So when you jack your four-wheel drive up to the sky and uh, as they do in the US, you know, 35s or 37s or bigger and, you know, big lifts and all that. When they want to tow a trailer, they need to actually drop their tow ball down to a height they can, you know, tow the trailer from. And uh, so they have these drop hitches, which are for light duty work. Yeah, they're it's, it, like light duty towing. They're, yeah, they're it's, it, like 
light duty towing, they're fine, but that's about it. Well, this gentleman's hooked onto that, which also has a tow ball on it. And I believe he's hooked to the tow ball with the strap. So as a result of this, we're changing the terminology. And I, I want to start using this terminology from this point forward. We've always said never recover off a tow ball, which is true enough. But I think we're better off using the terminology we never, we never recover off a tow hitch because that actually includes the whole device that goes into the receiver on your tow pack. And so because it's not a tow ball that failed here, it was actually the tow hitch. And where it failed, when you understand leverage, which I'm sure most people will when they see images of this, which I'm sure you'll have in the show notes, the section of steel that held the tow ball is like eight inches, so that's what four, uh, 200. That's what four, uh, 200 millimeters off the center line of the hitch, and that's obviously pulled away from the vehicle and pulled itself off the weld where it goes into the hitch. So the plate has separated from the hitch at the weld and busted away. And now we've got this projectile which has flown through the windscreen of Ryan's vehicle and hit him in the face and killed him. I I believe it was instantly, which is a great mercy. So we now have... The the operator did do something which I think is correct, and this this is a distinction that... We need to get get into our heads and we need to start communicating through the four-wheel drive community this distinction because it's a subtle distinction that gets missed again and again. And this is a classic example of it. And that's the difference between a tow recovery and a kinetic snatch recovery. Okay, so this guy has done a tow recovery, which is this. It's hooked up. You can have a tow rope. You could use a chain. You could use steel cable. You could use anything for a tow recovery because what you're going to do is very slowly drive up until the device becomes taut. And then once it's taut, you then apply power and you just try to pull the vehicle out of the bogging situation with the traction that your tyres can provide. And that is all. Now, the reason that's considered, you know, using those other devices, cable, chain, straps, snatch straps, recovery ropes, all of those devices, the reason why they're acceptable in this situation is the amount of force that a vehicle can generate in a tow recovery is relatively low relatively low and robert pepper and i are going to do a video shortly together and we're going to actually measure the amount of force we can generate from a vehicle with its traction the tires have on a road so we're designing that piece of content and we're going to generate that but i think we'll all be very impressed with how little force can be generated in that situation so this gentleman has done that he's come up he's tried to pull and that it didn't happen and then apparently one of the chain links broke on the bridle that he'd set up so this is either the chain was faulty it, it, something was wrong a link was damaged or he wasn't just doing a tow recovery i obviously don't have all the detail but it failed, so he's then reset his, his connection points to a single point of the vehicle, of the front of the bogged vehicle, and proceeded to do another tow recovery where he just simply drives up to the strap and goes for the tow. Now, I'll just highlight at this point, any time you're doing multiple, I, I call them hits or points where you're applying load to your recovery devices, any time you do after you've done two or three, come and check your rigging, check everything's working correctly and don't just keep smacking things and just keep hitting and hitting, you know, or towing and towing. You want to check your device. So he's done that and it hasn't moved the vehicle. So apparently at that point, he then transitions from a tow recovery to a kinetic recovery. And this is the subtlety that I want us to understand uh, right now. The kinetic recovery uses exactly the same equipment, but it it does not use a chain. It does not use a steel rope. It does not use any device that does not stretch and is not designed for kinetic recovery. And primarily, there's two devices out there in the marketplace which are designed for kinetic recovery. One is a snatch strap and one is a recovery rope which is a bit hovery rope. 
which is a bit of a newer product coming into the market. And we'll get to the difference of those if you want to in a little bit. So what this gentleman has now done is he's tried the toe recovery, didn't succeed. So he's now transitioned to a kinetic recovery, which is simply by backing up a bit further and generating kinetic energy in his vehicle and then driving off and hitting the recovery equipment, hitting the bog super duty and trying to get it out. And because his equipment wasn't didn't stretch to my understanding and so on, and he was connected to his drop hitch via the tow ball, when he's hit the strap with that kinetic energy, he's busted the steel frame or tongue section of the drop hitch away from the, the the square tube going into the hitch. He's busted that weld clean off. And now you've got, I'm guessing, going into the hitch. He's busted that weld clean off. And now you've got, I'm guessing, a, a kilo and a half, two kilo lump of steel flying at a very great rate of knots towards Ryan's head. And that's where, where it landed. So, yeah, so that's where it all went wrong was that moment where he transitioned from well, there was multiple elements contributing to this death, but, you know, he shouldn't have used a drop hitch. He shouldn't have transitioned from a toe recovery to a kinetic recovery without using the proper equipment. So it, it is, I've said a lot in that. Is there any questions or clarifications, James? I'm just having a look at some of the photos here because they are, oh, I think they're fairly graphic. One of the things that really sort of stands out to me is there's a sad photo with a cross from where mm. he was actually bogged. And this is, you know, taken in the daylight, so the rest of the photos are taken at night. The vehicle's really quite badly bogged, but it doesn't look that... If you came across, most people would have a crack at because it doesn't look that bad. But when you go and have a look at the vehicle as it's actually bogged, it's well mm. and truly bogged. As you can see in that photo, I'm looking at it as well as we speak, you can see on the left-hand side of the screen towards the cross side, it's quite a bit softer. Mm-hmm. And you see how the front of the vehicle has really broken through that crust and is quite low in the mud. And you can see how the rear wheels have got those two quite deep holes back there where the rear wheels were. Now, this is where reducing recovery load is so important. If they had got a shovel, and okay, it's a ton of dirt you're going to have to move from the front of that vehicle. But in some of the other photos, you can actually see that the front of the vehicle is well planted into the mud to the point the bull bar bottom rail is under the mud. You can see that in in, uh, the shot with the snatch strap, or the strap, I should say, going through the windscreen. You see the one I mean? Indeed. Yeah, and obviously if you're listening to this while you're driving, you know, we apologise you can't see the photos. But, uh, yeah, you can see that the front tyres are down to the centre of the hub. So let's assume he's running a 33-inch tyre. I mean, these guys could well be running a bigger tyre than that. But let's assume it's a 33-inch tyre. So he's got, what, 15, 16 and a half inches under mud on that front tyre we can see. You can see that the wind deflector under the indicators there is down in the mud and bent backwards a little bit. And you can see the bull bar, the lower rails, under the mud as well. So all of that could be cleared out with a shovel in, you know, in 10 minutes of work. Imagine how much less energy you need to recover that vehicle just by doing that. Now, under the vehicle, as we all know, you've got a differential that's probably sitting in that mud and suit. You've got both front and rear. You might have some A-arms on your suspension components, which are also in the mud. So clearing those out is all going to contribute to making this recovery load lighter. This- Absolutely, yep. Mm. And so this is where the complacency, the bravado, the I'm in a hurry, all of these things come to bear. And I'm not pointing fingers. I really have to watch myself with this stuff and be very dedicated, uh, very, what's the word, self-critical, I suppose, maybe that's the word, and disciplined myself because I'm very much a she'll be right, mate, get it done type of person. But when it comes to recoveries, that's not acceptable. It just isn't acceptable, and we've got to be very mindful of following safer procedures because I can't imagine what it would be like to watch your dad get smacked in the head with a tow receiver. Exactly. I mean, one of the photos that I think is really important is that there's an image of the steering wheel, and it's actually hit the steering wheel and bent it. Mm -hmm. That's an incredible amount of force. Yes. That is. I mean, steering wheels are designed to bend in an accident. Are designed to bend in an accident. 
So they, you know, they're not as strong as you might think. But yes, it's a lot of force. A lump of two kilo steel flying at some phenomenal rate of knots has got a lot of energy in it. While we're talking about energy, I do want to come back and talk about the differences between ropes and, st- and straps later. But while we're talking about the amount of energy, I want to reference to a video that our friend Robert Pepper has done. And for anybody who's listening, I really appreciate a lot of what Robert does because he really gets into the detail of things in a way that I don't have the skills to do. And so I, I'm, I'm a big fan of his work. But he's done a video which will be linked in the show notes. He explains to us how much energy a vehicle can generate in a kinetic recovery like this. So this vehicle was apparently about a 9,000 pound, so about a four ton vehicle. And that's what, you know, you would expect with these vehicles. They're, they're a large thousand pound, so about a four ton vehicle. And that's what, you know, you would expect with these vehicles. They're, they're a large four wheel drive, a lot bigger than what we use here in Australia for the most part. So you've got four tons of equipment. Now at two kilometers an hour, it's generating a certain amount of kinetic energy. Here's the scary number. All right. You jump your speed from two kilometers an hour to four kilometers an hour. You might think I'm all I'm doing at that point is doubling the amount of energy my car has. That's actually incorrect. What you're doing is quadrupling it. You're making it four times the amount of energy that you have, your vehicle has when you go from two kilometers an hour to four kilometers per hour. And so now if four kilometers an hour is really slow and you jump that up to eight kilometers an hour. It's just exponential, the amount of speed. Now, in first load, the forces that we're talking about here, it's all measured in joules, and Robert's a far better gentleman to to speak on that stuff than I am because I failed math dreadfully in school. But suffice to say that the amount of energy we're putting into these vehicles when we do a kinetic recovery is terrifying. Like, we're not talking one or two tonnes of force not that it's measured in tons, we're talking about multiples of that. And I think we need to realise and understand that as four-wheel drivers and start to treat kinetic recovery with a whole heap more respect. And it's not that it can't be done safely. It can be, but it should be done as a last or only done in the right options where it is the best means of recovering given other considerations. And it should be done when you've reduced the recovery load and it should be done with a great deal of care. But these videos you see of old mate in his 79, full thong slapping and, you know, got second gear pinned and the vehicle probably does weigh a good three to three and a half tonne. The amount of force they are, or kinetic energy they're charging up into that vehicle before it hits their strap, it's just, I don't know how to put it into words. It is terrifying and you, you, I think you'd stop doing it if you once you understand that and start to think about that and that's the message I'm doing my best to try and get, communicate here and is, is just slow down and increase your speed I think this would be the key if you're doing a kinetic recovery your first hit is as slow as you can drive the vehicle that's how hard your first hit is and your second hit is only a tiny bit faster than that then you might jump out and check the equipment and the setup and then you might increase your, your speed a tiny bit more and then a tiny bit more and then more and then a tiny bit more and then you go, we've got to find a different procedure to recover this vehicle. And that's about it. So you're really talking first gear quite slow and that's, that's as hard as you really go in a kinetic recovery. So yeah, it's quite terrifying though. We'll leave this episode here. There'll be a second part. Matt is going to go through some of the techniques that they could have used to try and get out when they were bogged that deeply in the mud. I think that's really important. Do check out the show notes. There's lots of resources there. And really importantly, please share. If you see Matt's videos, this podcast, the blog article that we've done on 4x4 Earth, please share them because the thing that worries me is a recovering off a tow ball on the face of it, if you don't know any better, 
it doesn't exactly sound like a really bad idea, but it can have tragic results. So the key here is to get those people who are going out for their first time, those people who are going out for their first time, to be aware that if they do get stuck, they shouldn't be recovering off a tow ball. We see it happen far too frequently. People either want to recover really quickly and take a shortcut or they simply don't know any better. They don't know the risk that they are putting themselves and others at. So, yes, please share it on the socials if you see it. 4x4earth.com is used by over 200,000 people every month to find great tracks, organise trips and find out how to better enjoy exploring the great outdoors. There's over 1,000 tracks and 300 campsites ready for you to explore. So check out 4x4earth.com today and sign up to get access to the track information, ask questions and meet other 4x4 earthers. Membership is completely free.